of air. Where? Here. A small step for mankind, but a giant step for us. Axiom 1, the war machine is exterior to the state apparatus. Proposition 1, this exteriority is first attested to in mythology, epic, drama, and games. I'm going to butcher all the French names in this, by the way. Georges Dumézil, in his definitive analysis of Indo-European mythology, has shown that political sovereignty or domination has two heads. The magician king and the jurist priest. Rex and Flamen, Raj and Brahmin, Romulus and Numa, Varuna and Mitra, the despot and the legislator, the binder and the organizer. This is like Carl Schmidt if he was capable of joy. Um, undoubtedly, those two poles stand in opposition term by term, as the obscure and the clear, the violent and the calm, the quick and the weighty, the fearsome and the regulated, the quote-unquote bond and the quote-unquote pact, etc. But their opposition is only relative, they function as a pair. In alternation, as though they express a division of the one or constitute in themselves a sovereign unity, uh, quote, at once antithetical and complementary, necessary to one another and consequently without hostility, lacking a mythology of conflict. A specification on any one level automatically calls forth a homologous specification on another. The two together exhaust the field of the function, quote. They are the principal elements of a state apparatus that proceeds by a one-two, distributes binary distinctions, and forms a milieu of interiority. It is a double articulation that makes the state apparatus into a stratum. It will be noted that war... Here, let me just quickly make sure I understand what's being said. I'm learning too. Yeah, that's what I thought. It will be noted that war is not contained within this apparatus. Either the state has at its disposal a violence that is not channeled through war, either it uses police officers and jailers in place of warriors, has no arms and no need of them, operates by immediate magical capture, quote-unquote seizes and quote-unquote binds, preventing all combat, or the state acquires an army, but in a way that presupposes a juridical integration of war and the organization of a military function. As for the war machine itself, in itself, it seems to be irreducible to the state apparatus. To be outside its sovereignty and prior to its law, it comes from elsewhere. The war machine comes from elsewhere. Indra, the warrior god, is in opposition to Varuna no less than to Mitra. He can no more be re it's a question apparently. He can no more be reduced to one or the other than he can constitute a third of their kind. He can no more be reduced to one or the other than he can constitute a third of their kind. I don't know what this means. The war machine cannot constitute a third of the state apparatus? Rather, he is like a pure and immeasurable multiplicity. The pack, an eruption of the ephemeral and the power of metamorphosis. He unties the bond just as he betrays the pact. He brings a furor to bear against sovereignty, a celerity against gravity, secrecy against the public, a power puissance, puissance against sovereignty, a machine against the apparatus. He bears witness to another kind of justice, one of incomprehensible cruelty at times, but at others of unequaled pity as well, because he unties bonds, etc. He bears witness above all to other relations, with women, with animals, because he sees all things in relations of becoming rather than implementing binary distinctions between states, quote unquote. A veritable becoming animal of the warrior, a becoming woman, which I don't know what that means, which lies outside dualities of terms as well as correspondence between relations. In every respect, the war machine is of another species, another nature, another origin than the state apparatus. By the way, this is like hundreds of pages in to uh, the second part of a two part book. Um, uh, Anti-Oedipus, Capitalism, Schizophrenia. So, there's a whole ton of context here I just don't know about, because there's like 900 pages preceding this, and we're just running with it. Or maybe it's just how it is. I don't know. Let us take a limited example and compare the war machine and the state apparatus in the context of the theory of games. Here we go. 
Let us take chess and go from the standpoint of the game pieces, the relations between the pieces and the space involved. Chess is a game of state or of the court. The Emperor of China played it. Chess pieces are coded. They have an internal nature and intrinsic properties from which their movements, situations, and confrontations derive. They have qualities. A knight remains a knight, a pawn a pawn, a bishop a bishop. Each is like a subject of the statement endowed with relative power, and these relative powers combine in a subject of enunciation that is the chess player or the game's form of interiority. Go pieces, in contrast, are pellets, discs, simple arithmetic units, and have only an anonymous collective or third-person function. Quote-unquote, it makes a move. You hear that, though? It could be a man, a woman, a louse, an elephant, but not a deer. Go pieces are elements of a non-subjectified machine assemblage with no intrinsic properties, only situational ones. Thus, the relations are very different in the two cases. Within their milieu of interiority, chess pieces entertain biunivocal relations with one another and with the adversary's pieces. Their functioning is structural. On the other hand, a go piece is only a milieu of exteriority or extrinsic relations with nebulas or constellations according to which it fulfills functions of insertion or situation, such as bordering, encircling, shattering. If anybody is not familiar with go, I'm assuming you're all familiar with chess. The way go is played is... In chess, there are sides, right? You you have your pieces lined up on the board, and the sides themselves have a particular uh, part to play in the game. When a pawn reaches the other side, it gets promoted to whatever piece you like, and it's always a queen unless you're like trying to make some kind of statement. And there's a directionality to it. Pieces can only go in one direction relative to your side, or certain pieces can't. Um, pawns, specifically. In Go, by contrast... There are no real sides, because the aim is not the elimination of the opponent's pieces. The aim is to control most of the board. So how this works is you have a grid, and you put your there's there's white and black stones representing each side. You put your stones onto the inter uh, onto the intersections between the uh, between the squares of the grid, and what you want to do is encompass the largest amount of space. So that at the end of the game, you you count. The, the amount of uh, vertices, I guess, um, the amount of intersections that are contained by your pieces, because you capture territory by encircling it with your pieces. And once it's encircled, it can, no, it can never be taken away from you. Um, you can capture enemy pieces if you manage to find them isolated and encircle them entirely by capturing all of the, they're called liberties, the lines that come off of them, that, that, that like extend from the, the vertices that they're, they're sitting on top of. Um, very difficult to do a lot of the time. Typically, you end up just like uh, lining up against each other as you as you combat one another. But but the point is though is that there's no there's no directionality. See in chess, it's like there's something like a state there, something like a wall. Your pieces are arrayed from from the beginning. They are arrayed against an ordered opponent. Um, you have a king that can be taken. Um, your your side must be defended because if they manage to uh, get their pawns into your territory, they can now start deploying very powerful pieces right behind your lines. And it's basically game over at that point if they manage to do so. That isn't the case in Go. In Go, uh, it's purely abstract. There, there are no fixtures. The only fixtures in the game are what are created by the dynamics of the game itself. The board itself has nothing permanent. Uh, prior to the battle. Ergo, a go piece has only a milieu of exteriority or extrinsic relations with nebulas or constellations according to which it fulfills functions of insertion or situation. So go pieces have no moves, right? Their only function is to, is to be a part of a movement that is dynamically emergent through things entirely outside of itself. Its, its only function is not as, like a, like a knight, a knight can do this. It has things it can do, right? That's that's where its value comes in. A go piece, by contrast, it's just it's just a brick in a wall. That's that's all it is, and they're all the same. A go piece is only a milieu of exteriority or exchangeable relations with nebulas or constellations, according to which it fulfills uh, functions of insertion or situation, such as bordering, encircling, shattering. 
All by itself, a go piece can destroy an entire constellation synchronically. A chess piece cannot, or can do so diachronically only. So when you capture the final liberty, of course, like you can you can take out an endless number of pieces. It's only limited by the number of uh, squares on the board. Or I guess vertices on the board, because we're talking about go. But what is proper to go... Sorry. Uh... A chess piece cannot, or can do so diachronically only. Chess is indeed a war, but an institutionalized, regulated, coded war. With a front, a rear, battles, right? There are sides to a chess board. But what is proper to go is war without battle lines. With neither confrontation nor retreat, without battles even. Pure strategy, whereas chess is a semiology. It's interesting that he says this. Chess is, of course, like an analogy often used by people like Wittgenstein. Uh, finally, the space is not at all the same. In chess, it is a question of arranging a closed space for oneself. Thus, of going from one point to another, of occupying the maximum number of squares with the minimum number of pieces. In Go, it is a question of arraying oneself in an open space, of holding space, of maintaining the possibility of springing up at any point. In chess, of course, like your, your pieces are limited to where they are. In Go, your opponent has no idea where your next piece might be. Because you can place it practically anywhere, especially late game. The movement is, I guess, not so much late game. The point, though, is like, it can go anywhere. It's, it's sort of dictated a little bit, or determinated, rather, a little bit by um, where pieces are kind of crystallizing, like where spaces are, are growing and concatenating. So, that, you know, that's, that's where the, the interest lies, but... You know, they can technically pop up anywhere. You can put a Go piece into an empty... I think it's been it's been the longest time since I've actually played Go. I don't know if you can just put them down... I don't, I don't think you need to put them down in connection with other pieces. I think you can put them down anywhere. But it's dangerous because isolated pieces are... Uh, they can be... They can be captured. In Goat is a question of arraying oneself in an open space, of holding space, of maintaining the possibility of springing up at any point. The movement is not from one point to another, but becomes perpetual, without aim or destination, without departure or arrival. The smooth space of Go is against the striated space of chess. The nomos of Go against the state of chess. Nomos against polis. This is a very interesting line. So... For people who remember my Schmidt videos and my Nomos videos, Nomos is the it's the partitioning of land into discrete units. And it's the assemblage of discrete units within like a holistic unit, like the assemblage itself. That's the nomos of a of a community. Um So Go is a game of nomos, essentially. You are carving out the world. Whereas chess presumes the polis, chess presumes the state. This is a very interesting comparison. The difference is that chess codes and decodes space, whereas Go proceeds altogether differently, territorializing or deterritorializing, uh, or deterritorializing it. Make the outside a territory in space. Consolidate that territory by the construction of a second adjacent territory. Deterritorialize the enemy by shattering his territory from within. Deterritorialize oneself by renouncing, by going elsewhere. Another justice, another movement, another space-time. Quote, they come like fate without reason, consideration, or pretext, unquote. Quote, in some way that is incomprehensible, they have pushed right into the capital. At any rate, here they are. It seems that every morning there are more of them, unquote. Uh, Luc de Hoche? analyzes a Bantu myth that leads us to the same schema. Um, in Congolo, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, an indigenous emperor and administrator of public works, a man of the public and a man of the police, gives his half-sisters to the hunter Mbidi, Imabidi, who assists and then leaves. Imabidi's son, a man of secrecy, joins up with his father only to return from the outside with that inconceivable thing, an army. He kills an Inkongolo 
and proceeds to build a new state. I, I'm assuming it's in a Congolo because, like, um, like you know the name Unjuin? There's, like, an unspoken syllable uh, prior to the, the consonant N. I, I'm, I'm probably getting this terribly wrong, though. I'm deeply apologetic to whoever I'm, whose name I'm mispronouncing. Between, quote-unquote, the magical despotic state and the juridical state containing a military institution, we see the flash of the war machine arriving from without. If anybody has seen The Expanse, you think of the way in which uh, the uh, because there's there's no set territory in space besides like space stations and whatnot, and even those are vessels that can move. the uh, The Belter faction doesn't actually occupy any concrete space. There is no territory that is its state, right? They simply appear. They appear, and their rule is based entirely on a a dynamic construction of areas of, of control that are, are established by force in the moment. From the standpoint of the state, the originality of the man of war, which incidentally is what a, a military vessel is called, his uh, eccentricity necessarily appears in a negative form. Stupidity, deformity, madness, illegitimacy, usurpation, sin. Dumazil analyzes the three quote-unquote sins of the warrior in the Indo-European tradition. Against the king, against the priest, against the laws originating in the state. For example, it's sexual transgression that compromises the distribution of men and women, or even a betrayal of the laws of war as instituted by the state. The warrior is in the position of betraying everything, including the function of the military, or of understanding nothing. It happens that historians, both bourgeois and Soviet, will follow this negative tradition and explain how Genghis Khan understood nothing. He, quote-unquote, didn't understand the phenomenon of the city. Genghis Khan didn't understand the phenomenon of the city. An easy thing to say, the problem is that the exteriority of the war machine in relation to the state apparatus is everywhere apparent, but remains difficult to conceptualize. It is not enough to affirm that the war machine is external to the apparatus. It is necessary to reach the point of conceiving the war machine as itself, a pure form of exteriority, Whereas the state apparatus constitutes the form of interiority, of interiority rather, we habitually take as a model, or according to which we are in the habit of thinking. Interesting. So, think of the go board where it's just, it's, it's a sandbox essentially. You have no idea about the directionality or the dynamics that will come into play once the game starts, whereas with chess, there are, like we, there are, um, there are a, a strict limit to the moves that can be can be had at the beginning of the game because you can you can't place pieces just anywhere if anybody saw that awful anime um code geos there's a really stupid part in the beginning where uh the uh, the main character lelouch goes to challenge a noble to a game of chess and you don't see the game of chess afterwards just afterwards uh his friend is asking him like why did you move your king first it's like a if the king doesn't lead, the pawns don't know where to go, or some nonsense like that. You can't move the king first in chess. The king can only move one space, and he's encompassed by his own pieces at the beginning of the game. Physically impossible. Um, things like that. Like, there is a rigidity to chess that there is not to go. Go is, is like, it's fucking elemental. Um, so, uh, state apparatus constitutes a form of interiority, we are in the habit of thinking. Chess is a game that has, like, the habit built in is is the walls, right? Like, there's there's a shape to the board. There's a directionality to the board. There's no directionality in Go. There's just the board. The board is like, the Go board is like the Hobbesian state of nature. What complicates everything, what complicates everything is that this extrinsic power of the war machine tends, under certain circumstances, to become confused with one of the two heads of the state apparatus. Sometimes it is confused with the magic violence of the state, at other times with the state's military institution. For instance, the war machine invents speed and secrecy. He's following there, I should say, uh, Deleuze and Guattari are following off of Virilio here. The war machine invents speed and secrecy. But there is all the same a certain speed and a certain secrecy that pertain to the state, relatively, secondarily. So there is a great danger of identifying the structural relation between the two poles of political sovereignty and the dynamic interrelation of these two poles with the power of war. Maybe there should be italics here, with the power of war. 
Dumazil cites the lineage of the Roman kings. There is a Romulus Numa relation that recurs throughout a series of variants and an alternation between these two types of equally legitimate rulers. But there is also a relation with a quote unquote evil king, Tullius Hostilius, Tarquinus Superbus, an upsurge of the warrior as a disquieting and illegitimate character. Or a Marco Inaros for people who are uh, watching the expanse. Shakespeare's kings could also be invoked. Even violence, murders, and perversion do not prevent the state lineage from producing quote-unquote good kings, but a disturbing character like Richard III slips in, announcing from the outset his intention to reinvent the war machine and impose its line, deformed, treacherous, and traitor as he claims a secret close intent, totally different from the conquest of state power and another, and other relation with women. I'm going to have to look back on this and see what the hell he's talking about with women here, because I am deeply confused. In short, whenever the eruption of war power is confused with a line of state domination, everything gets muddled. Sorry, I've got a fur of cocky stuck in my teeth, apparently. The war machine can then be understood because everything gets muddled only through the categories of the negative, since nothing is left that remains outside the state. But return to its milieu of exteriority, the war machine is seen to be of another species of another nature, of another origin, built aloud a... One would have to say that it is located between the two heads of the state, between the two articulations, and that it is necessary in order to pass from one to the other. But quote-unquote between the two, in that instant, even ephemeral, if only a flash, it proclaims its own irreducibility. The state has no war machine of its own, it can only appropriate one in the form of a military institution, one that will continually, continually cause it problems. That's a very interesting point. This explains the mistrust states have toward their military institutions, and that the military institution inherits an extrinsic war machine. That's very interesting. So there's sort of a breakup here between the, the kind of Weberian idea of the state as having a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence and the fact that the violence that the state has a monopoly over well it doesn't really need the state does it all right Carl von Clausewitz has a general sense of the situation where he treats the flow of absolute war as an idea that states partially appropriate according to their political needs in relation to which they are more or less good conductors. Oh, it's the other way around. Virilio followed after D and G. Is that a fact? I thought they. I thought um, Deleuze and Guattari were readers of Virilio. Hang on, hang on a sec. Let's double check this. Let's double check this. Oh come on, Virilio! No index, really, really, really. But you have a bibliography, don't you? You must. Surely you do. I thought Virilio was after Deleuze and Guattari. Like, Virilio, I think, died relatively recently, no? Not, like, recently, recently, but, like... I don't remember him uh, citing Deleuze and Guattari, at least. Maybe he's a filthy plagiarist. Isn't that a cool title cover, though? Like, it's 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 subjectively ugly. Like, the, the kind of stark yellow with the... What is that? Is that like a rail map? I don't know. The map on the front? But it just has such a, such a Cold War charm to it. I love books that look like this. Trapped between the two poles of political sovereignty, the man of war seems outmoded, condemned, without a future, reduced to his own fury, which he turns against himself. 
The descendants of Hercules, Achilles, then Ajax have enough strength have enough strength left to proclaim their independence from Agamemnon, a man of the old state. But they are powerless when it comes to Ulysses, a man of the nascent modern state, the first man of the modern state. I I find this sentence weird. The first man of the modern state, Ulysses. I don't think so. And it is Ulysses who inherits Achilles' arms, only to convert them to other uses, submitting them to the laws of the state. Not Ajax, who is condemned by the goddess he defied, and against whom he sinned. So uh, after Achilles' death, and I think after the uh, taking of Troy, I could be wrong on my timeline here, there were games, uh, there were contests played to see who would inherit Achilles' armor, because he had this, like, god-gained armor, right? Like, he had this gigantic shield with, like, this etching of, of mythological scenes on it. And, um... And what else did he have? He had like this, like this, this like gorgeous gold plating things. I can't remember what the pieces of them are. But um, Ajax didn't win the games, and he killed himself afterwards, out of despair. In Penthesilia, Achilles is already separated from his power. The war machine has passed over to the Amazons. A stateless woman people whose justice, religion, and loves are organized uniquely in a war mode. Descendants of the Scythians, the Amazons spring forth like lightning between the two states, the Greek and the Trojan. They sweep away everything in their path. Achilles is brought before his double Penthesilia. And in his ambiguous struggle, Achilles is unable to prevent himself from marrying the war machine or from loving Penthesilia, and thus from betraying Agamemnon and Ulysses at the same time. Nevertheless, he already belongs enough to the Greek state that Penthesilia, for her part, cannot enter the passional relation of war with him without herself betraying the collective law of her people, the law of the pact that prohibits, quote-unquote, choosing the enemy and entering into one-to-one -one relationships or binary distinctions. Throughout his work, Kleist, this is the author of uh, Penthesilia. I actually want to read this now. Um... <laughs> He's going to bring up uh, Goethe later, but, like, these freaking plays, they're so bloody long. Germans, man. Like, where's my copy of Faust? It's got to be somewhere here. Here we go. Like, I thought, oh, like, it looks it looks slim, right? Faust. I'll be able to, I'll be able to read this in, like, a weekend, because it's a play. This thing is, like, this volume is almost 800 pages long. Or I guess 730, but like, dear God. I guess the actual play isn't that long. The interpretive notes account for most of it, but like, several hundred pages. This is a play? This is a play. The entire audience would have died of blood clots. I drag my foot like weight of lead. I feel the gout. My arm is dead. I hear you there, Faust. Or whoever the hell was saying that. Throughout his work, Kleist celebrates the war machine, setting it against the state apparatus in the struggle that is lost from the start. Doubtless, Arminius heralds a Germanic war machine that breaks with the imperial order of alliances and armies and stands forever opposed to the Roman state. But the Prince of Homburg lives only in a dream and stands condemned for having reached victory in disobedience of the law of the state. As for Kohlhaas, I miss Kohlhaus, Kohlhaas, his war machine can no longer be anything more than a banditry. It is, is it the destiny of the war machine when the state triumphs to be caught in this alternative, either to be nothing more than the dis excuse me, either to be nothing more than the disciplined military organ of the state apparatus, or to turn against itself to become a double suicide machine for a solitary man and a solitary woman? Goethe and Hegel, state thinkers, both see Kleist as a monster, and Kleist has lost from the start. Why is it, then, that the most uncanny modernity lies with him? It is because the elements of his work are secrecy 
speed, and affect. Secrecy, speed, and affect. And in Kleist, the secret is no longer a content held within a form of interiority. Rather, it becomes a form identified with a form of exteriority, that is, always external to itself. Similarly, feelings become uprooted from the interiority of a subject, quote unquote, to be projected violently outward into a milieu of pure exteriority that lends them an incredible velocity, a catapulting force. Love or hate, they are no longer feelings, but affects. And these affects are so many instances of the becoming woman, the becoming animal of the warrior, the bear, she dogs. What the hell does that mean? Somebody help me out with this. Goodness, this weird obsession with the becoming woman. Affects trans pierce or trans purse just to trigger uh, Ambrose. Affects trans pierce the body like arrows. They are weapons of war. The deterritorialization velocity of affect. Even dreams, Homburg's, Penthesilia's, are externalized by a system of relays and plugins, extrinsic linkages belonging to the war machine. Broken rings. This element of exteriority which dominates everything, which Kleist invents in literature, which he is the first to invent, will give time a new rhythm, an endless succession of catatonic episodes or fainting spells, and flashes or rushes. Catatonia is, quote, This effect is too strong for me, unquote. These potions are too strong for you, traveler. And a flash is, quote, The power of this affect sweeps me away, unquote. So the self, moi, is now... Nothing more than a character whose actions and emotions are desubjectified, perhaps even to the point of death. Such as Kleist's personal formula, a succession of flights of madness and catatonic freezes in which no subjective interiority remains. There is much of the East in Kleist, the Japanese fighter, interminably still, who then makes a move to quip to see. I think he's watching uh, too many kung fu movies. The Go Player. Many things in modern art come from Kleist. Goethe and Hegel are old men next to Kleist. Could it be that it is at the moment the war machine ceases to exist, conquered by the state, that it displays to the utmost its irreducibility, that it scatters into thinking, loving, dying, or creating machines that have at their disposal vital or revolutionary powers capable of challenging the conquering state? Could it be that it is at the moment the war machine ceases to exist conquered by the state that it displays to the utmost its irreducibility that it scatters into thinking, loving, dying, or creating machines that have at their disposal vital or revolutionary powers capable of challenging the conquering state? Is the war machine already overtaken, condemned, appropriated as part of the same process, whereby it takes on new forms, undergoes a metamorphosis, affirms its irreducibility and exteriority, and deploys that milieu of pure exteriority that the Occidental man of the state, or the Occidental thinker, continually reduces to something other than itself? Is the war machine already overtaken as part of the same process whereby it takes on new forms and deploys that milieu of pure exteriority that the Occidental man of the state or the Occidental thinker continually reduces to something other than its... That is a strange sentence. That is a strange, strange sentence. Is the war machine already overtaken, condemned, appropriated as part of the same process whereby it takes on new forms, undergoes a metamorphosis, affirms irreducibility and exteriority, and deploys the milieu of pure exteriority, that the Occidental man of the state or the Occidental thinker continually reduces to something other than itself? I see. Sorry, so what's, what's continually reduces to something other than itself 
is the same process whereby it takes on new forms and undergoes a metamorphosis. That's a weird sentence, guys. I'm not even sure it's coherent, actually. I'm going to have to review that later. What am I reading? I am reading the uh, treatise on nomadology in Deleuze and Guattari's uh, Thousand Plateaus. That's proposition one, huh? Oh dear, I zoomed right by it, didn't I? All right, well, that is proposition one. This is problem one. Is there a way of warding off the formation of a state apparatus or its equivalents in a group? Proposition two, the exteriority of the war machine is also attested to by ethnology, a tribute to the memory of Pierre Clasters. We'll come back to this later, I think. But yeah, well, I will continue this soon. The treatise on nomadology is, I think, a couple like 150 or so pages long. It's 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 decently long. We're not going to go through the whole thing tonight. I just wanted to get through that first section. Um, this is really interesting. I'm going to be deploying a lot of this, as I've been sort of indicating throughout this, to my nomos of Delta Lauda. Um, basically, nomos of the Expanse. Like, I mean, you could even think about like the the chess go distinction in terms of. Like, think about how uh, Inaros attacks... Spoilers, by the way. How Inaros attacks Earth in uh, Season 5? Season 4? I can't remember. In one of the later seasons, by launching uh, asteroids from space at Earth. Where would Earth fire back? You can't. There's nowhere to fire back. It's chess versus go. Earth has a baseline where all of its pieces are lined up. And if you get your pieces by them, there is a definite advantage to doing so. But there is no such advantage in the other direction. In fact, it's only when Inaros tries to take the ring gate at the end that he ends up he ends up dying because he's he's hooked himself to a lion. And now the lion can be taken. And when the lion's taken, he's taken. Um, you can get you can get checkmate in chess. You can't get checkmate and go. There's only the score at the end. It's sort of like um, sort of like Othello in that respect. Actually, it's a really good analogy to it. It's sim very similar to Othello in some ways. Um, Earth and Mars in the Expanse is a chess game. You have sides, you have pieces, you have engagements, battles in the middle. And there's a push. One side wants to take the other side by eliminating its material or whatever, but there are sides to be taken. Belt allowed by contrast is playing Go. And they can't even take planets because their their organs are developed in zero gravity, so they can't survive under planetary gravity. So they are uh they are literally only playing for resources that are floating spaceless in space. Because there's no places in space. It's just a void. Um, it's just an empty grid. It's not even a grid. So. They can appear anywhere. There is no, there is no intrinsic directionality to it. There's no direction they must come from. There's no direction they must go. Yeah. 